joining us tonight. <clears throat> a reminder for people who are here, over on that table, we have all sorts of booklets and odds and ends. I've got one of uh, Jay Warner Wallace's books over there that hasn't been grabbed already called God's Crime Scene. Really good stuff there. And a bunch of tracks. And uh, you're welcome to just flip through them and see if there's a track that might be interesting to you or a friend or whatever. So uh, plenty of good things here. Steve's got handouts in the back for tonight's uh, talk. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing kind of a combo because we're trying to get a lot of different religions done in just these 10 weeks. So <clears throat> I'm going to split time. I'm going to do Christian Science and Seventh-day Adventism. And uh, I, I was surprised reading some of that material, so I, I hope you find that interesting. Well, let me pray, and it'll be uh, Steve's night. Father, thank you so much for a chance to meet here. Thank you for uh, people that are concerned about the faith and interested in the faith and willing to come out and willing to join us online and pray that you give Steve uh, clarity and insight and we'll get something really useful out of tonight. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Anyone, anyone else need to hand out? Is this the sweets? Yeah. There's two of them. Okay, welcome to part two of our series on Jehovah's Witnesses. As Gary said, we're looking at different religious beliefs. And this one is a major one because everybody here has had contact with a Jehovah's Witness at some time in your life. So the information you'll get tonight I think is going to be very helpful. Also know this, that I'm here... And my house has like a dozen ladies because they're playing bunko. And I'm so glad I'm here and not hearing them call out those numbers. And uh, But they're having a lot of fun. And so so am I. Uh, I love talking about Jehovah's Witnesses. So sharing with the Jehovah's Witnesses. I got asked last week, how, Steve, how do you go 162 games? I gave that illustration of baseball that I was in the stands as a spectator. I was afraid to share with the Jehovah's Witness. I then got to the stage of striking out. I would try. They would beat me up. Then I moved to, to the extra innings. I was able to hold them off, but I wasn't able to really refute them. And then I got to the Grand Slam stage where I, I knew a lot about what they believed and why they believed it. And it wasn't the problem of the Grand Slam. It was the problem of me. Arrogance got in the way of sharing that I had to control my arrogance. And then finally I reached the 162 games where I was able to go 18 months and nine months with two different couples, not a couple, but pairs of Jehovah's Witnesses. And so my encouragement to you, if you want to go long term, you don't have to. My encouragement is to just get in there and try. And if it's a one shot deal, great. But if you want to go long term, the first thing is, is that your goal is to make friends at the first encounter. And as you go through and talk with them, they're, they're likely going to ask you, do you want to do a book study? And I say, say yes. Agree to it, unless you're not strong enough. Unless you think they're going to beat you up. But I agree to a book study. This seems to be the, the latest one. That's not the one that I did with them. I'll show you the one I did with them. But online, this is their online study. They're offering online courses now is what they do. I think they're visiting less. They used to visit a billion hours a year. A billion hours of witnessing going door to door a year in the Jehovah's Witness organization. So a lot of it is now that book studies like this and ask questions and don't come on too strong because you're thinking in terms of long term I want to go long term I want to develop this friendship and turn up the heat slowly all right last week if you were here or if you watched it online there were three key facts that need to be established in order to make the doctrine of the Trinity true. These are biblical facts. What is the first biblical fact? Does anybody remember? Bridget, you got it? One God. There is only one God. I should make some sort of memory tool with that, but there's only one God. 
All right, what's what's a second one? So one God. Holy Spirit is a person. Yeah, three. All three are persons, and we focus on the Holy Spirit because they think the Holy Spirit is like electricity. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are separate and distinct persons. And then third is, <laughs> Bridget, you got them all. You know why? Because I remembered it, and I taught it to my junior high one kids. Oh, it's, now this is what I love. Yeah. This is what I love, is that you take it and immediately find a way to use it. It's not always going to happen, but when it happens, it's it's encouraging to me yeah. that you're taking this and using it. So what was the third one? All three are God. Yes, each person is God. You want to learn material? Teach it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Why do you think Gary and I, some people say, well, gosh, you know so much. You know why we know so much? It's because we teach on a lot of topics. Some of my weakest topics, I, I develop a teaching so I can make it a strength. And that's what Gary does. We know this is true. The teacher learns more than the students do. If you're a teacher, you know that's true. You want to learn doctrine? Teach in the children's department. You are going to teach basic doctrine to children, and it will become embedded in you. So each, each person is God. So those are the three. And if these facts are biblical, and if they're true, then the Trinity is true. If they're true, if there's only one God, three distinct persons, and each person is God, then the Trinity is the solution to any problems you have in the scriptures. And this what this is why I find it's easy for me to talk to Jehovah's Witnesses. It's hard to defend error. Easier to defend truth. The scriptures make sense because the Trinity, I believe, is true. But they have all kinds of problems, and you're going to see some of that tonight. Friday, July 4th, 2008. Sounds like a long time ago. <laughs> it was. <laughs> yeah, it Jason and Connie come to my door. They're a married couple. And I have this, 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 this discussion with them. And I invite them into my house. And we sit down. And they're talking and Letting me know that the Bible will answer the deepest questions that you have. Oh. And I thought, wow, you know, that's that's really that's really good. Mm. And they said, Steve, are you interested in our materials? And I said, absolutely. I'm interested. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I had just been working on this Excel file. I, I do this Tour de France thing where it's kind of like fantasy football where we, my son and I do fantasy uh, Tour de France. Nice. And, and so I had our teams lined up because we pick teams and this sort of thing. And I mentioned that because I had just come off the computer when they came to the door. And Jason says, well, I'm a cyclist. Bingo. <laughs> we, we now have something in common that we next 10 minutes was talking about cycling. We're, we're making friends. Do you know that they're trained to do this too? Mm -hmm. They're trained to make friends with me and I'm making it easy on them because I'm trying to make friends with them. Mm -hmm. We're using the same tactics. There are times when I sit back and look and listen to what they say and I say, gosh, that's the same tactic I use. <laughs> it's fun. It's kind of fun because we're, we're mutually loving each other because they love me enough to keep coming back and, and talking to me. Then I asked him the question I mentioned last week. Why did you become a Jehovah's Witness? And both of them told me that they grew up in a Jehovah's Witness home, but they had to make it their own, just like the Christians today in our homes. If you've raised children, they have to make it theirs. It can't be, it can't be Steve's faith. It has to be my, my three kids. It has to be their faith. And it's the same thing with Jehovah's Witnesses. They felt that they needed to study it to see if it was true, and they were convinced that it was true. And that's why they were at my door. 
Then they ask me about my relationship. This is the fun part of it. It's because I ask them, it's natural for them to ask me. And so, as I said last week, I love to have the gospel embedded in my in my testimony. I talk about being an atheist. I didn't believe in God, did not, was not raised in a church family. We never went to church other than funerals and marriages were the only times I entered a church. And I talked about placing my trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins. And Jason said he really connected with my testimony. And I thought, wow, this, this is cool. Mm -hmm. And he, he also said this, he says, to stay right with God is hard. And I could agree, you know, I could agree that it, it is difficult to do what, what God asks us all the time, every day, every moment of the day, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Anybody do that every day, every moment? Mm -hmm. Uh-uh, I don't either. I don't even come close. But he said it's hard to be right with God. And I then made the key statement that, again, this is like part of the review. I made that key statement. I said, if I could be proved wrong, I would change what I believe. And you can almost see him going like this. <laughs> we discovered the truth. And now he's going to discover the same truth that we discovered. And he saw me as an excellent prospect. And he gave me a copy of this booklet that I have with me. And it's, if you were to look at it, you could just see it is marked up like crazy. This was the actual book, the booklet we were going to study. The greatest thing about this is that you can read ahead and you can see where you're going. You don't have to try to guess where you're going, the book does the work for you. And so you can analyze the book, you can look up the scriptures they have in there, and, and you're prepared. It's like a Bible study, and it is a Bible study. Just they're sharing their materials, but I'm going to come and give some counterpoints to their, their materials. But I wanted to slow things down so I didn't get to chapter 4 too soon. Why? Chapter four is on Jesus. <laughs> and I knew problems were going to occur once I reached the chapter on, on Jesus. So if I could go slowly through one through three, then I can continue to develop my friendship as they develop and do the same tactic on me. So they wanted to go slow also. Now, I anticipated they'd come back. One of the reasons is these booklets, they have to pay for them. So if they're giving them out right and left, it's costing them money. So I think they were investing in me. When they gave me this one, I thought, okay, they're serious if they're going to give me this one. And so, of course, I prayed for them. I prayed that they would return, and they came back. And back. And back. <laughs> and we'll talk more about that at the end. All right, here's where we're headed. We're going to talk about their tactics. I just explained a few of their tactics. They're the same. They're people tactics. They have good people skills because they've been trained to have good people skills. And we're going to look at some of their favorite passages. Can't look at them all. There's a lot of them. I'm only going to go through three of their favorite passages. And then I'm going to share you, with you my favorite, my number one. It's just, this is it. This is number one. But I'm going to share the second one. I've only gotten to use it once, but the second one is also amazing. It's, it's a three-in-one, a triple threat in the second one. So that's where we're going. Uh, we're going to look at their tactics. We're going to look at key passages that they are going to share with you at the door, and they're going to share them. Those three, they'll definitely share. And then how do you challenge them? All right, here's, here's the first one is they work in pairs. You know this. They come to your door. They come as a pair. And there's a strategy, and it's actually a very good strategy. The veteran is in front for the first few door-to-door -door visits. So the veteran is modeling what you should do when you're witnessing to someone at the door. And the, and the rookie is behind, paying attention, listening to the words, listening to the verbiage. Then when the, when the veteran thinks the rookie's ready, they switch places. Isn't that good? 
Isn't, isn't that the way probably we should be doing things? They're discipling on evangelism. The veteran is discipling the rookie. And so now the rookie's up front, and the rookie now does it. But if the rookie gets in trouble, who's behind you? Who's going to watch your back? It's the veteran. will step up. If the person is too strong, the veteran will step up and help. I think it's I think it's brilliant what they do on evangelism. How they love to give out the booklets, you know, it costs them. They used to think get them. Did they used to get them for free, Alan? No, it's all you've always had to put out money. Yeah, they're, they're cheap. They're not expensive. But yeah, you had to help pay for. You have no idea how many millions they print of these booklets. Millions upon millions, probably even into the billions, uh, these booklets. Mm. That's how much they publish. Uh, they're skilled at persu persuasion. One of the reasons is they practice. They meet Tuesday, Thursday, and Sundays, for the most part, the dedicated ones. Mm. And if I remember correctly, Tuesday night is they teach you how to persuade people at the door, how to be kind to people at the door, how to get a Bible study started. And they do role playing and all this, and it takes place on Tuesday nights. So you wonder why they're so skilled? They're so well trained. They're equipped for you at the door. They're ready for you. That's why a lot of people are intimidated by them. A lot of Christians don't want to share with them because they're so well equipped. All right, am, am I right? Mm -hmm. they, they can be scary. Talked to a young man at church last Sunday at Trinity. I go to Trinity, and he said that he saw them coming up and nobody else was home, so he didn't answer the door. Mm -hmm. I said, don't worry about it. I call that the spectator stage, and you're not alone. There's a lot of people that are afraid to open up the door when they come. Now, here's something to think about. They are the teachers. You are the student. They are from Jehovah. You're from Satan. Now, we think just the opposite, but... That's their mentality. If you step into teacher mode, they'll wrap up real quick and leave. Mm -hmm. This is all part of it. You, you want to be in student mode as long as you can. Yes, uh, uh, Jordan. Do Mormons, do Mormons do the same thing? Well, they... they come side by side. Every time I've encountered them, they're side by side because they're 19, 20, 21, 22 year olds. Mm -hmm. And so... It, it's not this dynamic that the Jehovah's Witnesses have. I haven't seen that. Uh, I've seen them both contribute. Now, you can tell one probably has more experience because that's the one who goes, does most of the talking. And so you will get a veteran, but they're using side by side. They're not front and back. Have you noticed differences in the ones that you're speaking with? A little bit, yeah. The small differences. Okay, but there's one that is more verbal and does more of the talking. What? Well, mm -hmm. Again, it's not as dramatic as Jehovah's Witnesses in their training method. Bob? What's the percentage of those that they contact that end up going in their direction? Do you have any idea? You know, I, I don't have the stats with me. I have collected the stats and done the math, and it takes... I, I recall it's over 5,000 hours of witnessing to get one Jehovah's Witness. Mm -hmm. That's why, but think about it. If you have a billion hours witnessing, then you're going to get quite a, quite a few new Jehovah's Witnesses, but mm -hmm. it's over 5,000 hours per convert. Yes. You told me once a long time ago that it's easy to convince young people as opposed to older people. He's recalling the conversation. We were doing witnessing. Our class went out to Cruising Grand, yes. and Bob hung out with me. And I said, we have to target young people. Mm -hmm. And he said, why? I said, because older people won't listen to us. Mm -hmm. They've heard it all. 
and they'll shut you down right away. And that was what happened. We, we, got, we met those three young guys and they were all ears. They're very respectful, the young people are, when you're sharing Jesus with them on the streets of Cruising Grand. Mm -hmm. And they stood there and Bob will attest to it yes. that uh, they listened, they understood the gospel, didn't mean they committed to the gospel, but at least they, they were pleasant. You opened the door. Yeah, it, it's easy on the streets to open the door to young people, not to older people. It's just, it's just funny. And I learned that from a, an evangelist who once a week is out on the streets. He said, Steve, and we went out to Cruising Grand together once, and he said, Steve, don't target the older ones. You're going to get nowhere. Mm -hmm. And the one older pair that I talked to just shut me down really quick. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, I get it. I'm going to go to the young people. So good, mm -hmm. good comment on that. But just remember, they're there to teach you. They're not there to be a student. Mm -hmm. So it, it's going to take some time. Again, this is Jehovah's Witnesses versus Mormons. Mm -hmm. And they love to use their new world translation. I have one right here proud owner of a new world translation. <laughs> Usually what I do is we, we go long enough, I just ask for it. You know, can I have a new world translation? Oh, sure. Now this is really expensive. You know, this, I, I've really taken it out of their pocket. So they're really invested in me if they're going to give a new world translation to me. But I do have that. And, and I actually, and you can find the new world translation under jw.org. I believe it's on the back end of your handout. You can go to their official site and they will have the New World Translation there. So you can pull it up on your phone. And if you, if you need to use it for any reason, you don't have to have the, the New World Translation. All right, let's take on three difficult passages. I have been accused of making problems where they've never occurred before. I had a woman say, I didn't think that was a problem passage until you you brought it up and then explained their view, and then all of a sudden, I didn't know what that passage meant. And so, I'm hoping that won't happen here. I'm hoping I won't confuse you by going over these passages. All right, here's one of their favorites, Colossians 1.15. He, talking about Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, you probably never looked at that and, and thought anything of that. Well, here's what they say. They say firstborn means first created. That's what they believe. That Jesus is the first creation. Then the universe gets created. And everything else, but the first creation is Jesus. And that's what they take firstborn to mean. But actually, firstborn means birth order, preeminent one, or heir. It never means first created. And preeminent one fits the context. And let's look at the context of the next two verses. Remember, Greg Kokel made a famous saying that he even wrote a little booklet on. What, what was his famous saying? Verses. Never read a Bible verse. So we don't want to just read 115. We want to read what comes after. And here's what comes after. He is the he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. For by him all things. You know, in the Greek, all things means all things. <laughs> Everything. Everything that has been created were created by him. Jesus is the uncreated creator. And Colossians 1, 16 and 17 support that. All things were created through him and he is before all things. In him all things hold together. All things means all created things. Jesus can't be created because everything that was created is here. And he's the creator of it. He can't create himself. Does that make sense? He can't be part of all things if, if all things were created by him and for him. And he's before all things. 
So I believe the best trans the best way to translate it or, or interpret it is the, the word firstborn means he's he's preeminent over all creation. He is he is the creator. David is called the firstborn. Here's some examples of where, yes, then has got something. What was their New World Translation meaning of that uh, verse 15 and 16 for by whom all things are written? We're going to look at that in just a second. Give me, give me a second. We're going to get to it because you're, you're bringing up a good point. David's called the firstborn. Let me ask you this. Was David the firstborn in the family? No, he was the last. He was the youngest. Yet he's called the firstborn. Why? Because he was the preeminent one. He was the chosen one. A man after God's own heart. Exodus 4.22. Israel is called God's firstborn. The nation of Israel is called God's firstborn. It doesn't mean created. It doesn't mean birth order. Now, first created, I mentioned that, but it's a different Greek word. Paul didn't use it. If you wanted to say first creator, you would have used a different word. But he used the word for firstborn. So how do the JWs get out of this mess? That's what, that's what Vince is alluding to. How do you get out of this mess? Well, you add the word other to the New World Translation. If you go look it up in here or online, you're going to see the word other is added. How do they do that? Well, watch this. Because by means of him, all, say that, other. other, all other things were created in heavens and on earth. Then down, we go further down, he says, all other things have been created through him and for him. Also, he is before all other things. And by all means, all other things were made to exist. So they're trying to prove that, that he is not God. There, yes, he's not Jehovah. He's a lesser God. He's a created being. And he's the first creation. Then all other things were created. You see that? All other things were created. He was before all other things. Mm -hmm. So he's the first one created by yes. God. And then comes the rest of creation. Yes, exactly. But they have to do, undo it by adding the word other. Mm -hmm. And you can go to this, you can go online, that other is there. What are the rules of adding words? Well, you cannot add a word that changes the, the meaning. So this is heretical, what they've done. Mm -hmm. The example is because by means of him, all other things were created. That changes the meaning. All four uses of other changes the meaning of what that passage talks about. Now, other was found in zero ancient manuscripts. None. There's no other in, in any New Testament manuscripts on Colossians 1. So other is their invention. They put it in to support their belief system. And... It's not even in their kingdom interlinear. You say, what's an interlinear? It's, you have the Greek here, and then directly below the Greek is the English. I had a friend who said, I don't have use for this, do you? It's a kingdom interlinear. They don't sell these anymore. Do you know why? Because they violate the Greek, and this points it out. This is published by the Watchtower organization and I have one of these, and this is awesome. This is, there is no other in the Greek. Even with their documents, there's no other. They just add it. They say it clarifies the passage. No, it doesn't. It changes the passage. There it is. That's the booklet I have that I was showing you. The Kingdom Interlinear Translation of the Greek Scriptures. Hard to find. I would suggest, I was going to do it before I came here, would be to go on Amazon, type this in, and see if there's any used ones. I have a rule of thumb. Do not pay full price for heresy. Right. So that would show that they added the other to it? This it would show the other is not in there. If, if you looked oh. it up here, 
and, and you looked at the Greek and then the English below, oh, the word other is nowhere to be found. Okay. In, in 16 through 18, there, there's okay. no other in there. Okay. Yes. A, a good online interlinear Bible, you can click each of the Greek words and it'll go to a dictionary and give you the meanings, all the meanings, like a Webster dictionary, of those Greek words. So it's very easy to go through and, and translate yourself. There's complications to that, um, but it shows what you need to see. There are lots of helpful tools. In the, inter the internet has brought such good, it's also brought such evil, but there's a lot of good, and, and Alan is right, there are a lot of tools, Bible study tools, and interlinears are online that you can do what he said. You can click on the Greek words and get the English, yes. It's about 30 or 40 bucks on Amazon. Really, new? No, used ones. They don't, they're, uh, the latest one they have is 1985. Okay. So, That's a lot of money to buy heresy. <laughs> I wouldn't do it. I got it for free. Yes. This is their own publication, right? They don't publish it anymore. They don't want people to have these. Because it, it, you know, in the John 1 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the yeah. Word was a God. Oh. A is not in the kingdom of the oh. See, things like that, where they add words or change words, this reveals it. Yeah. But they published that themselves. They published it before they were getting so beat up. They had to, they had to publish this to help them get through the messes and then mm -hmm. start hiding certain things. They don't want you to have this. Mm -hmm. So if you got 35, 40 bucks, <laughs> I wouldn't pay that much for it, but uh, uh, you're welcome to. Mm -hmm. Just remember this. Firstborn, according to context, is preeminent one. All right, let's look at making sense of difficult passages. Number two, Revelation 3.14. The amen, and they say that's Jesus, and I would agree, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. They say, there it is. He's the beginning of the creation of God. He's the first creation Revelations 3, 14 supports that. Well, is that true? So, beginning, arche, is the one who begins the origin, source, creator, first cause, or ruler. And I would say, according to the context, that first cause is the best. Let's back it up. Let's look at it. The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the first cause of the beginning of God or the creation of God. First cause of the creation of God. Now, how do, how do we know that's that's the, the best according to the context? Well, first off, in other passages, we see that Jesus is the architect of creation. He's the creator. How do we know that? Well, John 1, 3. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. All things. We're back to the all things again. All things mean all created things. Everything that was created, whether visible or invisible, were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. John 1.3. Colossians 1.16. We just looked at that. For by him all things were created. So first cause of creation is a good definition for the word arche. Ruler, ruler works in there. Now, interesting is arche in Revelations happens two more times. And it's a, it's pointing towards God, or they would say pointing towards Jehovah. And so you can ask him, if those two other passages that have RK in them, does that mean that Jehovah had a beginning? They're going to say, well, absolutely not. Then why do you apply that, that Jesus had a beginning, if the same word is used about Jesus is used about Jehovah? You need to be consistent. This is the same book, the book of Revelations. All right, one more. And then we'll look at my favorite pass passage and then the other passage to share. Jesus is speaking to Mary Magdalene 
And here it is, John chapter 20, verse 17. Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. You already see the problem here. There's this, this, one, this one is interesting. Jesus is talking about my God and your God. My God. Jehovah Witnesses says, He's calling Jehovah my God. If he, ha if he has a God, then he can't be God. Again, that's one of those passages that you read over and over. You don't, you don't see that. You go, ooh, I didn't know that was there. <laughs> All right. My God and your God, he's talking about the Father. Most of the time in the New Testament, when God is, is used, it's used for the Father. Unless maybe it says Jesus is God or you know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That, that obviously is not talking about the Father, but there are, one principle is that most of the time God is mentioned is, is speaking about the Father. And here when Jesus says, my God and your God, because we know it, I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. It's just like saying he, he's talking to the Father in two different ways, one by calling him the Father and one by calling him God. It's just addressing the Father, and he's addressing it from his human standpoint. How do we know that? Well, in the context here, Jesus speaking to Mary from his humanity, he says, go to my brethren. Does God, have a, does God have a brother or friends or relatives? No, but the human Jesus did. Go to my brother, brethren. Go to my brothers. He's talking from a human standpoint. And then the next part comes in. So just know that the voice that is there, that is Jesus, is talking from his humanity. He's fully God, and he's fully man, and he's speaking from his humanity. Now he says, my father. When he taught us how to pray in the book of Matthew, what does it say? I think it's in Matthew. He says, our father. So what in the heck is he doing saying, my father? Well, this is where you jump. You jump to John chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. And this is beautiful right here. Watch this. Talking about Jesus. But he answered them, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, and here it is, but also was calling God his own father, making himself, what does it say? It, equal with God. Whoa. I have shown Jehovah's Witnesses that, and they get silent. They get, they get quiet. They don't know what to say. They usually have something, to, always have something to say, a story to tell somehow to get out of it, but they don't know what to do with this where it says, making himself equal with God. When he says, my father, he is making this claim, and the Jews knew it, and they wanted to stone him for saying, that's blasphemy to say that you are equal with God. James White says this, if one of the divine persons enters human flesh, okay, there's three persons, only one, the second person of the Trinity enters the flesh is Jesus. How would such a divine person act? Would he be an atheist? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Would he be an atheist? Would he refuse to acknowledge those divine persons who had not entered into human existence? Of course not. He wouldn't be an atheist. Yet when we see the Lord Jesus doing exactly what we would expect, worshiping God the Father, saying, my Father and my God, Jehovah's Witnesses have to be assisted in understanding how Jesus is fully God and fully man. That's the battle. I spend all my time helping them understand that Jesus has a human side and a divine. He's fully God, fully man. Quote from James White. His Trinity book is wonderful. Uh, James White. All right, let's get to my favorite verse, and then I want to move quickly through this because I want to give you time for questions. All right, here it is. This is the this is where I stab. Is John 20, 28. Thomas said to him, he's addressing Jesus. 
Let me kind of back up a little bit. The disciples see the risen Jesus. Thomas is not there. He doesn't see the risen Jesus. So later, Jesus goes away, and the disciples said, hey, we saw Jesus. He rose from the dead. And Thomas says, I'm not going to believe what you say. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and his feet, I'm not going to believe. And then what happens? Jesus shows up and Thomas touched these wounds. And, and Thomas proclaims this. Thomas said to him, talking to Jesus, my Lord and my God. This is a home run statement. This is, in my mind, irrefutable. Now, here's two JW responses. And I, I hope you see how absurd they are. The first one is this flippant idea that Thomas was using God's name in vain, as we would do with saying, oh my God, or God this, or you know, you, you can fill in the blanks how people use God's name in vain. I, I've actually, they've actually told me this. And I, I said, that's a recent expression. That's an expression of today, not back then. You'll find it in zero writings, ancient writings, where someone said, oh, my God, or God darn this, you know, this. You're not going to find that in, in those writings. The word is acronistic. Acronistic means you're applying today's language or activities to, that were today into the ancient records. Like saying that Jesus rode a, a motorcycle into Jerusalem. <laughs> That's an anachronism, okay? Same thing with applying, oh my God, or any phrase that uses God like that. It doesn't, that's today's lingo. That's not 2,000 years ago. And a religious Jew would never say that. They were legalistic. They would never take the Lord's name in, in vain. Thomas was a religious Jew. He wouldn't have done that. So I've gotten Jehovah's Witnesses to say, okay, that doesn't work. <laughs> uh, here's their second one. Thomas looked at Jesus and said, my Lord, and then looked to heaven and said, and my God. What question do you think I asked immediately? Where does it say that? <laughs> where, it doesn't say it. I said, where does it say that? And they said, well, he's talking, obviously, to two different persons, the Lord and Jehovah and God. I said, it just says to him. Thomas said to him singular. Not to them, if, if we're talking... The, the father and the son, it would have been to them, but instead it's to him, my Lord and my God. But there's more to come. There's more on this. This is, this is where it gets fun. In the Greek, if you, if you look at the Greek and the English, it comes out that Thomas said, the Lord of me and the God of me. The God of me. Interesting. Ha theos is the God. This expression, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, is only used when describing Jehovah. Ha Theos, the God, is only used when describing Jehovah. I'm jogging at Great Day Park to Great Day Park and back. I'm a, that was a, kind of crazy for me. But I'm there at Great Day Park and there's a Jehovah Witnesses sharing with a guy and beating him up. So, of course, I've got to enter into the conversation. <laughs> so I enter in and, and I bring up this passage and that it says, ha theos. And he says, no way. I said, you go back to your kingdom hall and you go look it up. It says, ha theos. It says, be God. I'm going to do that when I get back. I don't know if he did or not. I don't know if he believed me. But I got smart after that. <laughs> I put on my iPhone from the kingdom interlinear, I put on my iPhone this, and here's the English over here in the kingdom interlinear. And in answer, Thomas said to him, this is using their words, my Lord and my God. Now we go over to the interlinear part with the Greek is up here and the English below. 
and it says, the Lord of me and the God of me, that's ha theos in Greek. That's ha theos. It's right there. I pull out my phone and say, here, read it. It's right here. I'm going to send that to you, okay? So you can put it in your phone. If you, you never know. I'm always with my phone. And if I run into a Jehovah's Witness, I was at Balboa Park and, and the guy said, I don't want to see it. And so it says, ha theos, it's your kingdom interlinear. Why don't you look at it? He said, I don't want to look at it. I don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> he did not want to look at that. I had support for what I was saying. And it's from their materials. That's what makes it the, the most fun. I didn't have that at the time, but I went home and figured out how to get it on my iPhone. And I can send that out through Gary. Uh, you can get a copy of that. So, bottom line, ha theos, Jesus is Jehovah. See, Jehovah is just another name for God. Mm -hmm. Don't think of Jehovah as only the Father and, and shrink it down. Jehovah is, is, is God. Jesus is God. He's Jehovah. The Hebrew that they use to come up with Jehovah is Yahweh. W-H-W-Y-H-W-H. -W -H -W -H, Yahweh. And that's what you find. When we capitalize Lord, it's really in the Greek or the Hebrew manuscript, it's using Yahweh. And that's where they put in Jehovah. So Jesus is Jehovah. But they're always trying to prove that he is not God. That's exactly right. He, is, he can't be Jehovah. All right, here's the triple threat. Here are the beliefs of Jehovah's Witness. Here's three of them. This triple threat hits all three of these. It's brilliant. I didn't invent this. I got this from uh, an apologetics expert. All right, first thing they believe, when you, when you die, you cease to exist. You go out of existence. We talked about it last week. 144,000 eventually go into heaven. You're not part of the 144,000, but you're still a Jehovah's Witness. You go to the paradise earth. But everybody else ceases to exist. And you're going to cease to exist for a period of time. I don't know how long, but you're going to cease to exist. Uh, second, Jesus resurrected spiritually and not bodily. Not a bodily resurrection. It was a spiritual resurrection. That's number two. And number three, we've talked about Jesus is not God. Let us see what verse can, can nail all three. This triple threat. I love this. John chapter 2, 18 to 21. Jesus is talking to the religious Jews in front of the temple. He's right in front of the temple. And he tells the Jews, oh, the, the Jews say this. The Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? So they're challenging Jesus. And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. The temple is right behind him. Okay. So he says to the religious Jews, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. Ooh. That may give you a hint what he's talking about. And when he says destroy it, I will, raise, I will raise it again in three days. The Jews re replied, they got to be facing the temple. It has taken 46 years to build this temple, but you are going to raise it up in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. All right, let's break this down and show you how all three get hit on this. This is fun. All right, first off, to raise yourself up from the dead, you have to be conscious. When Jesus died on the cross, he was conscious. That breaks their, their doctrine. You are supposed to cease to exist. Jesus can't raise himself from the dead. If he's not conscious. So he has consciousness after death. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. And I, I will raise it again in three days. He says that his resurrection is going to be bodily. He says, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. Remember, he said, destroy this temple, destroy this body on the cross, and he will raise it up again. It's going to be a physical body. It's not a spiritual resurrection. It's a physical resurrection. 
That's number two in the triple threat finishes here. He would he would raise himself up from the dead. Something only God can do. Only God can raise the dead and then keep that person alive for all eternity. Only God can do that. And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. So consciousness, he had consciousness when he died. That, that breaks their doctrine there of you go out of existence. Second, it was a bodily resurrection. They believe it was only spiritual. That one's nailed. And only God can raise someone from the dead and keep that person alive. A true resurrection that Jesus experienced only can be done by God. Therefore, Jesus is God. Triple threat. So let me quickly review and give you some encouragement. First off, let them lead in any first encounter. If you want to go 162 games, let them lead. Write down the verses in your favorite Bible, not the verses, but the answers. Things that I've given you in these handouts, I have a certain Bible. If you were to go through it, you'd see JW and M. <laughs> there's my JW answers, and there's my Mormon answers. All the way through, this, they're in the margins. When I would get up there, all I would do is read the margin. It's like having a cheat sheet, okay? And now I no longer need the cheat sheet. But I did for a long time. I needed the cheat sheet to help me in the counters at the door. You don't have to memorize this stuff. I hope you're not against writing in the margins of your Bible. A study Bible writes in the margins. So why not you? You know, why not us? Why not let us write in the, in the margins? And then we share according to the situation. If it's short term, I'll use John 20, 28. If it's a one, you know, they have their little stands and their magazines there. If it's a one-shot deal, I'll go to John 20, 28. Now, they're going to want to go to John 20, 17 about Jesus saying, uh, my father and your father, my God and your God. They're going to want to take you there and say, see, you know, he can't be God because of this. But remember, that leads, I put you put in the margins, go to John 5, 17. And that phrase, my father, means Jesus was saying he was equal with God. So both short and long. If, if it's long term, I hold that verse for a while. I don't put it out there. And if I put it out there, I put it out there with questions. I don't just shove it down their face. I use questions. Form the, the friendship first and then slowly introduce information. Dylan and I, Dylan Valenzuela and I went 18 months with Jason and Bobby. Connie was the first one. She bowed out at the first meeting. Steve came the second meeting. He was the heavy to check me out to see if I knew too much. And he, I passed. <laughs> and then Bobby came the rest of the time. All right, here's some resources. This, this is probably my favorite Jehovah's Witness book. It's reasoning from the scriptures with the Jehovah's Witness. And one of the reasons I like it is it asks questions. A lot of it is set up, here's the question to ask. So I like that, of course, can't get away from tactics. I love Greg Kogel's tactics, how to ask good questions. And then IRR is the Institute for Religious Research. I'm gonna push that for Jehovah's Witnesses and for Mormons. The president or ex-president, I don't know if he's still president, but uh, I had a class with Robert Bowman and that's his website and Bowman is brilliant. Just brilliant. And then that's my website. I have quite a few articles on Jehovah's Witnesses. And then there's the official site. All right, let me open it up, up for questions that you may have. Yes, sir. How do they explain Matthew when the spirit eats fish? <laughs> you know, I've, I've thrown it at them, and I can't remember their responses. I, I've used that after the resurrection, remember Jesus. Peter's out of the water, and Jesus is frying up some fish. I, I hope he cleaned them first. I don't know. But he's he's having a meal. He has a meal, and how can a spirit have a meal? There's other things they have to explain appearances. But the one from John is a sneaky one. 
it sneaks in. They're not prepared from the one from John that the temple he spoke of was his body. That one catches them. They're ready to come up with some story. They are great at storytelling. They have a story for every challenge you have. They have a story. And, and sometimes if I finally get fed up with their stories, I say, that's a nice story, but what evidence do you have? Because a story is not an argument, but they think it is. They tell the story, and then what I mean by story, it's some sort of explanation in story form of how to explain it. But it's not biblical. It's not a passage. It's not based on the Bible. It's based on, a, on an illustration. An illustration is not an argument. It's just an illustration. They've got to come up with the argument is the point. So I think they're pre more prepared for that, but this John passage is sneaky uh, and, and comes in the back door. Yes. Oh, uh, so like Mormons, they get like their stuff from Joseph Smith? Yes. Where did Jehovah's Witness get it from? Like they're weird. It stuff. starts with Russell. Okay. And Russell was the one who started it. And Alan last week mentioned that Russell hated the doctrine of hell and had to come up with a completely different teaching. And so that's why the going out of existence type thing and coming back as a Jehovah Witness either on earth or in heaven, they needed to get rid of eternal damnation. And that's a lot of groups do not like the doctrine of hell. Truthfully, I don't either, but it's yeah. scriptural. Yeah. And Jesus spoke about it more than anybody else. So I'm forced to believe in, in a doctrine that I don't particularly like. But it's there. Yes, Bridget. So how, how do they have a right relationship with, with God and get to be part of the 144? <laughs> the 144 is such a mythical thing. Alan could probably address the 144. It's it's mm -hmm. it's mysterious, shall we say. Am I right, Alan? So there's no heaven. There's no heaven. Yeah, yeah, for the 144,000. But for heaven. the average Jehovah's Witness, no, there's no heaven. But they're just a paradise earth. Mm -hmm. That's why they have those cheesy pictures on the front of their right. magazines. Right. They're so bad. Right. <laughs> they need a new artist, Alan. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So this is it. This is it. This is, this well, is it's going to be a paradise, they believe. It's going to be a wonderful place where the lion lies down with the lamb and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So it, it will be a perfect earth like the Garden of Eden. So there you go. Will work. But how do you, like, you know, we know that salvation comes with Jesus Christ and we have grace and mercy, forgiveness of our sin. So what do they do about their sin? Here we go. And I'm prepared for you. I pulled this off to JW.org on that issue. This is their words. It's not my words. To gain salvation, you must exercise faith. Now, I've called a Jehovah Witness on that. I said, where in the Bible does it say exercise faith? He says, I don't know. I said, it's nowhere. It, 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 it's nowhere in the Bible. And exercise sounds like something I do. <clears throat> You know, I'm doing exercise. I'm a physical education teacher, okay? I know what exercise is. What does exercise faith mean? Uh, make them define that. Uh, but you must exercise faith in Jesus and demonstrate that, that faith, that faith by obeying his commands. Now, it's impossible. Well, it is, but yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. You know, they, they don't give much leeway there. That's a good point. But look at the second part of this. This is this is very interesting what, what I pulled off. Uh, it says the Bible shows that you must have works. Well, we would say the same thing. We would say you are to believe in Jesus, trust in him. That's the point of salvation. Then after salvation comes sanctification. Sanctification is the process of becoming more like Jesus. So... Uh, a lot of this I can agree with. The Bible shows that you must have works, okay, or acts of obedience to prove that your faith is alive. That's what James says. James works well with, with Paul in, in Romans 4. However, this does not mean, now here's, this is kind of blew me away. I think this is recent. This does not mean you can earn salvation. 
It is God's gift based on this undeserved kindness or grace. Those last two sentences, I can agree with. That's exactly what we believe. But I, when I sat down with, with Jason and Bobby, I had to convince them that faith is here and then there's a line drawn. You have now been saved. You've received the Holy Spirit. Then part two happens, sanctification. You start becoming more like Jesus. But they're, they're separated. Well, it sounds like they've moved in that direction. But if you have the wrong Jesus, it can't save you can't save you anyway. So a created Jesus does not have the power to save you. But it's interesting how this seems to be new. And even Alan, who was a, who was part of the organization, Alan said, I've never seen anything like this. We, we looked at it before class. And this is this was new to him. I pulled this minutes before I came here. But, but Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, God, not by uh, works. works, so that yeah. no man may boast. I read there, he says, you, the Bible shows you must have works to prove your faith. To prove. They're marrying Jane. They put, they put a lot of emphasis on James. Faith without works is Jesus. it's dead. Faith without works is dead. We, could, we agree with James. Faith without works is dead, but we also agree with, with Paul. When he says that, that we can't work for it, because if we work for it, we get wages from for what we earn. And there, there's no way to earn salvation. It is trusting in the blood of Jesus that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, and he took our place. And we get his righteousness and all the good, and he gets our sin on the cross. So I don't understand when, on the last slide, it says, um, that you have to put your faith in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Why they are so Jehovah? Where does the where right. does the Father? Mm -hmm. How do they separate the Father and Jesus? Other than calling Jesus a God. If you're putting your faith in Jesus, you're not putting your faith in Jehovah. Right. Yeah, and and I I brought that up before, and again they work around it. Alan, you know the, the point is. They make a big deal that the name of God is Jehovah. That's his name. That's his personal name. And that's why we should be always calling God the Father, one person, God the Father, Jehovah. But the point she's making is that everything here is about Jesus. It's not about Jehovah. Right. Your salvation is through Jesus. <laughs> it's, it is through Jesus. How did, how did this created being get above? In fact, if you read that, Nathan had sent that to me. I had read it too. That article that was sent with the email from uh, Gary. Did you send? Did you send that out? And it was written. What's it? A uh, Robbie Lashua. Yeah, Robbie Lashua, new, newest addition to the Standard Reason team. And he shows that the sacrifice of Jesus is the is the higher love than the Father. So how can a created being be higher than the Father because of his sacrifice? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Who does who does the higher love? Who shows the higher love? Mm -hmm. Jehovah for sending him or Jesus for dying on the cross for us? Mm -hmm. And that was the point of that article that I sent you. I thought that's kind of indicating the same thing here is that it is Jesus that saves, not Jehovah. Mm -hmm. So they can't rectify that. They'll probably give you a story. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the story covers all. The illustration covers all. Uh, I don't have an exact answer. Yes, Nathan. Uh, you know, interacting with uh, them and also with Mormons is a lot of times they're quoting from the script. It is like I said, they're the teacher, you're the student. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to shut up and listen, essentially. <laughs> okay. But you know, so they'll they'll they have like responses to these things that they've already kind of been taught okay when they say this this is what you say and you know and that's where questioning asking questions comes in it's like okay well you know that's a great story but you know what's your basis for believing that why would you believe that that's the better answer to this or you know how did you come to the conclusion that you know that uh you know jesus is a lesser god based on this passage why is that the interpretation so, and the thing is, they're not going to really be able to answer that because if they're quoting from a script, they haven't really thought about it very deeply. Mm -hmm. And that's, 
not no, no fault of their own. It's just that's what they've been taught over over the years before they come out to witness to people. Mm -hmm. And if Christians, we fall into the same category. Sometimes we quote from a script, we don't think very deeply about what we just said, and so that's why we need to constantly go back and compare it to scripture to make sure that we're on the right track of what we're teaching people. This is a contradiction right there. To gain salvation, you have to exercise, you have to work. Yeah. You have to demonstrate that faith by obeying, which is again works. It's yeah, see, that's grace. the thing. It the, works. The salvation we receive is a gift. It's like grace. It's it's a gift. Yeah, if I right. it's Christmas and I don't know Nathan, but I give him a gift, has he earned it? Has Nathan earned that gift? Yeah, no. That gift. I think you're bringing up a good point. Is they're talking yeah. about gaining and exercising, mm -hmm. and they're making faith into a work. Right. And I think you make Bridgie. I think you make a really good point. Yeah. We don't believe that. It's a. It's unearned. It's undeserved. Mm -hmm. I am the worst. Paul yeah. said it. Yeah. I am the worst of all sinners. Yeah. I don't deserve this gift. I don't deserve this grace. But it sounds like. Gaining and exercising, yeah. you have to earn it. So I think that's a great point. We'll take one more question. This isn't really a question, just a, a statement that I got from a ex Jehovah Witness recently. I asked her, How did you escape mm -hmm. into becoming a believer in Jesus? Mm -hmm. And she said, She married a Jehovah's Witness. And he controlled her life absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's what we you know, obeying his command. Mm -hmm. It's not really saying that Jesus that she had to comply with, it was a tyrannical husband. Mm -hmm. And in her family background, anyone that was not Jehovah Witness, she could not she was not allowed to talk to. Mm -hmm. You couldn't um, mm -hmm. associate with anybody outside the faith. And then when she did become a believer in Jesus only, she wasn't allowed to enter her home of her family. She had to sit outside on the porch mm -hmm. because she had been unfriended. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, Alan, have you heard of anything like that? Well, they do what they call disfellowship. And it's also called shunning. Shunning. Well, yeah. it is shunning. Yeah. I never heard that word used when I was growing up, there, but that is what they do. Uh, mm -hmm. As you get into it and you learn what their control mechanisms are, you find out they are very much a cult. And mm -hmm. they have you give up all your existing friends if you're coming into the faith mm -hmm. rather than growing up at it. But you're going to give up all your friends, you're going to give up all your family, you're going to give up everything. And the only people you will associate with are other witnesses. Mm -hmm. So if you do something wrong, then they're going to, there's a probationary thing that they do where you are essentially kicked out. You can't talk to any witnesses. Well, that means there's nobody in the world that you can talk to. Mm -hmm. You're isolated. And this is a, a type of punishment that we use isolation in prisons to punish unruly prisoners. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a psychological punishment. Mm -hmm. And they use that to control the people. Mm -hmm. She had a mental breakdown. Mm -hmm. well, I, don't, I, don't I, I can see I, that. I, is, is it? Yeah, go ahead, Alan. Yeah. Um, I want to point something out. As we go through and we study the witnesses, we see the problems in the Bible. So it's tempting for us to attack that Bible. And they're taught that as soon as somebody attacks that Bible, they are supposed to run. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. The best way I think to get around this is that uh, when you see something in the Bible and that comes into question, you can try to argue it, but you're arguing that you're always, you're dancing through the translations. Mm -hmm. It's easier just to but look at some of the scriptures in Matthew and other places where it says, even if a spirit comes to you, an angel comes to you, test what it's telling you. And I ask him, well, have you tested this Bible? Mm -hmm. You know, where, where does it come from? Who wrote it? Mm -hmm. Because if they go, well, we, we don't talk about who wrote 
this new translation mm -hmm. because we don't want to get a big head, you know, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. You go, well, then how are you going to test the Bible? I mean, Jesus is telling you, test what the Spirit is telling you. Why wouldn't you test what yeah. man is telling you if he wrote and translated the Word of God? Why would you not test it? Why is the proof that it's true? Yeah. Right. I on my website I wrote an article on the New World Translation and I have the authors who who wrote it because the internet exposes everything. There was a leak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was a leak and I got so I, I have the names of the authors and none of them knew Greek, none of them knew Hebrew. One claimed he did and in, in a court on a different thing, he got exposed and he didn't know Hebrew. Uh, they were not scholars, they just changed the King James Version and altered it so that it would fit their belief system. Mm -hmm. And so I have an article called The Problems with the New World Translation. It has been hit like 150 times. It, if you write Problems with the New World Translation, my article goes right to the top. It's really funny mm -hmm. to have an article that is on the top of Google. <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's quite a privilege. That was the only one this happened. A lot of people, a few have given me compliments and thank you for publishing this. Majority have attacked me uh, for putting that out there, but that's that's what, what comes and goes. So let me pray, and then if we have further questions, uh, I'd be I'd be glad to answer them. Ah, uh, Father, you are a great God, a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we just thank you for grace that the Watchtower organization just seems to. Make it so it's not understandable that you don't understand what the true grace is and what grace and mercy is, and that it's only given as a gift. It's not earned. And we're so thankful and undeserving of your grace and mercy. And we just thank you for what Jesus did on the cross in saving us. And we just pray that you will equip us, give us confidence to talk with Jehovah's Witnesses and help them to leave a, a deceitful organization. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.